You know, it's kind of interesting. There's so many diets out there and uh, the DASH diet is called Dietary Approach to Stopping Hypertension. It does more than just stopping hypertension. They can actually slow down dementia. It can sl slow down atherosclerosis. And it, it's really an amazing diet. So the, the, the team has put together a wonderful presentation. And uh, what are we going to learn about the DASH diet? <laughs> okay, so hi, everyone. And welcome to our weekly webinar. We're Angino and Juni from the Cooking Club, and today we're going to be giving you the dish on DASH diets. Um, so eating healthy is the key to staying healthy and reducing any risk factors that may negatively impact your overall health, in particular, your cardiovascular health. And oftentimes, it can be difficult to figure out what to eat, and that can be a challenge with so many resources and recommendations, um, and to find meals and diets that assist your individual health goals that are sustainable. So there's many diets that exist to help provide some sort of framework to guide the foods you select uh, and that can complement your health concerns, medications, lifestyle changes, and overall the decisions you make to stay healthy. But today we're gonna be diving into the history behind the DASH diet in specific, how it works, and hopefully we can impart some advice that can help you reduce your risk factors with a dashing diet. So this is a broad overview of the topics that we'll be covering today. So many of you already know what high blood pressure is. Perhaps hearing the phrase high blood pressure is raising yours now, and in many ways, rightfully so. Around 7.5 to 8 million Canadians, or around one in four adults, live with high blood pressure. Now, why is this number a concern? This statistic tells us that within our population, there are a number of risk factors contributing to an increased fraction of hypertension within Canadians. In 2012, it was reported that self-reported hypertension prevalence increased by approximately twofold over nearly two decades in Canada. An increase in antihypertensive drug prescription may have led to more controlled hypertension, but there's still an underlying problem. But what could it be? If I asked you what you ate for lunch today, do you think it could answer that? So before we get into the dash, um, let's backtrack to what high blood pressure or hypertension is. So blood pressure is the amount of force that circulating blood exerts on the arteries as the heart pumps blood to deliver oxygen rich blood and nutrients to your whole body that's essential for function, as you can see in this diagram. So high blood pressure is blood pressure that's above your normal, or in other words, it means your blood is exerting too much force on the artery walls, uh, which damages the interior linings of the artery and the heart. And this strain and damage can cause the arteries to slowly narrow making them more susceptible to plaque formation or the buildup of cholesterol and fat deposits in a process called atherosclerosis, which can occur gradually over time. So this is exactly why um, high blood pressure is a silent killer. And you shouldn't exactly wait until you see a high blood pressure reading to make changes to your lifestyle. And Judy will explain this further, but blood pressure does fluctuate. So you might feel excited or nervous. And for those of you who've seen us in the clinic, uh, you might experience some white coat hypertension where your blood pressure might rise based on emotions, stress, and other environmental factors. However, having high blood pressure measures um, that are consistently higher than your normal uh, blood pressure readings may prompt a diagnosis for high blood pressure or hypertension. So what are some of the risk factors or causes for hypertension? As you can see here, and these are the factors that we'll tackle in this diet-focused webinar, many risk factors are associated with an unhealthy diet. So firstly, an excess of sodium or a high sodium diet can increase blood pressure. Um, kidneys and other organs are no longer able to process it, and that sodium will then be diluted into the bloodstream. And this can cause plasma volume expansion or an increase in blood volume that forces the heart to pump faster, um, ultimately increasing blood pressure. And another risk is low potassium in the diet. And potassium has the exact opposite of sodium in that it helps increase sodium excretion and relax the blood vessels, lowering blood pressure. Now, typical North American diets are high in sodium and low in potassium, which causes this imbalance that poses a risk to increasing blood pressure. Now, another factor is high levels of alcohol consumption. Alcohol affects the heart muscles and it can act as a vasoconstrictor with initial intake. Um, and this means that blood vessels narrow and cause restricted blood flow and then increase blood pressure. And a final risk factor that we've listed here is high cholesterol. So as we explained earlier, um, as cholesterol builds up in the arteries, it's plaque. Um, this can cause the hardening and narrowing of the arteries and can increase blood pressure. So as you can see, there's a lot of risk factors here that are associated with diet. 
And the DASH diet can address some of these areas. So high blood pressure is the number one risk factor of stroke and a major risk factor for complications like heart attack and heart disease. We mentioned this to preface and strongly encourage all viewers to evaluate your health status, speak with a healthcare provider if you're experiencing any symptoms, and to start making healthier decisions that can potentially save your life. So we strongly encourage you to check out the many, many videos on our page that further investigate hypertension and other cardiac complications to gain better insight on your health. Um, here's one short video that does a really great job of summing up hypertension. And if you checked out this video, you'll be able to answer this pop quiz question, whether all individuals with high blood pressure experience symptoms. And you can find the answer in the description box below, but we strongly encourage you to go check out this video to find out that answer. Now let's dive into the DASH diet. So to start, let's define DASH. DASH stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. And it is just that. The DASH diet's origins began in the 1990s from several research projects funded by the National Institute of Health in the US to investigate specific dietary interventions and their implications in treating hypertension. So it's a dietary approach that's supported by a lot of research and data. And it's also one of the most recommended diets next to the Mediterranean diet, which is very similar um, in vegetarian diets. And it's consistently been ranked as one of the best overall diets due to its flexible, balanced, and heart-healthy eating plan. So the DASH diet is based on two studies, the DASH and the DASH sodium trials, of which, later, uh, which the latter Juni will detail. So the initial DASH study recruited about 456 individuals to participate in an 11 week long with eight weeks of intervention, randomized control trial, which tested three different dietary patterns. So the subjects had an average systolic blood pressure that was less than 160, and an average diastolic blood pressure between 80 and 95. Um, and these readings were taken during some screening stages, which constituted six measurements of blood pressure readings over three screening visits over the trial length. Now here we wanna mention that because there's a disproportionate burden of hypertension and overall access to healthcare and treatment in minority groups, especially in black individuals, this study did recruit a diverse group with over two thirds of the cohort representing minority groups. So we stress this important of research being representative and applicable to diverse and realistic populations, which a lot of research might lack. So further, 49% of the subjects were women, 60% were black, and about 37% had a household income less than 37K. So there's a clear understanding here of the application of these resources to broader demographics in terms of racial and ethnic groups um, and also economic status. So for the first three weeks of the study, participants re received the first diet or the control diet. And all the, all the meals were actually prepared by the researchers to main, cons maintain consistency. So this diet followed a typical American diet. It was low in potassium, calcium, and magnesium. Um, overall, the macronutrient and fiber intake was pretty average, but this diet included more saturated fats, added sugars, and processed, food, uh, processed foods. And it lacked a lot of essential nutrients um, and had a very high carbon, high fat content um, in, the, in the meal plans. That's pretty representative of a typical North American diet. So if you're seeing this picture and feel like it looks a little similar to your own lunch, there's definitely some room for improvement. So for the remaining eight weeks, the participants were divided into three diets, including the control diet. The second diet was the fruits and vegetables diet. To the control that it remained pretty typical. However, it included fruits and vegetables. Um, so a lot more potassium and magnesium was added to the diet. Um, it was higher in fiber and fewer processed foods. Um, but if you're looking at this picture and still feel like it looks like your lunch, there's yet still more room for improvement. So the final experimental diet was the combination or DASH diet. So this diet was rich in fruits and vegetables, low fat dairy products, uh, reduced saturated and total fats, high fiber and lean protein. So it was higher in potassium, magnesium and calcium. It included whole grains and overall had a reduced or reduction in um, snacks and sweet consumptions. So this picture demonstrates what the DASH diet entails, uh, a diet rich in healthy carbohydrates and fats, uh, which incorporates a lot of plant-based sources for most of its macronutrient and micronutrient components. Um, this is likely not what your lunch looked like today, and that's all right. Um, as we progress through this DASH journey, it's our hope that this picture might become a little bit more attainable by the end of this video. 
So what researchers were really testing was, do changes in blood pressure differ between each of these dietary patterns? So does the addition of these healthier components in the DASH diet have an effect on blood pressure outcomes? And if so, how significant? So as you can see in this figure, the DASH diet or combination diet had some pretty significant results in reducing blood pressure. So the top graph over here shows um, uh, measurements for the systolic blood pressure and the bottom shows average just diastolic blood pressure measurements uh, and the associated tread, uh, tread lines follow the, the same order of the diet. So you can see the control diet is the top line, the one with the black dots uh, and the combination diet is the lower line. So you can clearly see that the DASH diet significantly reduced blood pressure in comparison to both the control and fruits and vegetables diets. Uh, in fact, it reduced systolic blood pressure by 5.5 and diastolic blood pressure by three more than the control diet and reduced systolic blood pressure by 2.7 and diastolic blood pressure by 1.9 more than the fruits and vegetables diet. So the key LT here is that the DASH diet did play a role in reducing and controlling blood pressure. So some other main outtakes of the DASH trial was that blood pressure reduction on average began within the first two weeks of uh, starting the DASH diet, so of starting intervention. So this means that the diet is capable of yielding successful reductions in blood pressure within a short amount of time. Um, that is with complete compliance. Um, as well as this, the similar patterns of reductions were seen in men, women, and members of minority groups. So this ties back to what we were saying a little bit earlier about research being representative and applicable to diverse demographics. So overall, they saw a 10% reduced risk of cardiovascular disease. In women, this was about 13%, and in Black adults, this was about 14%. So another outtake is that the DASH diet can be a nutritional approach to preventing hypertension. So that's not to say that it's a supplement for other measures like weight management, lowering sodium, um, and alcohol consumption, but rather something that complements it. Um, in addition to that, it can complement drug therapy and other treatments that are prescribed by your doctor. Um, in, some, in some cases of mild cases of hypertension, it can reduce the need for medication, but rather than replace, it's a complement for, a, it complements um, um, those who are experiencing later stages of hypertension and how you can manage it. So finally, um, the DASH diet, if it were to be adopted by the greater population, it could reduce population incidence of coronary heart disease by 15% and stroke by 27%. So overall, the diet has some pretty, pretty big implications in improving cardiovascular health. So the DASH diet was further tested with the Omni Heart Study or the Optimal Macronutrient Intake Trial for Heart Health. The DASH, DASH diet had already shown reduction in blood pressure and um, LDL or low density lipoprotein cholesterol uh, with fairly high uh, healthy carbohydrate profiles with fruits and vegetables. Um, but the Omni Heart Study added two more variations to this. So in one diet, they substituted 10% of daily calories of carbohydrates with protein, half of those being plant-based proteins. And the second diet had the same substitution, but instead with unsaturated fats. So these diets further reduced blood pressure and improved lipid profiles and overall re reduced the risk of cardiovascular disease, further showing the benefits of creating a healthy and balanced nutrient profile. So now that we've discussed some of the origins of the DASH diet, let's jump into what it looks like. So I want you to take a look at this list and then take a look at your fridge and your pantry. Are you able to see some similarities or some things that you can find in the back of your fridge or pantry? Or perhaps do you lack some of the components listed here? So the DASH diet focuses on fruits and vegetables as well as whole grains, low fat dairy products, nuts, seeds, legumes, lean meats like pol uh, poultry and fish, um, high fiber and an increased take of micronutrients including potassium, magnesium and calcium. So these are the key principles to the diet. On the other hand, the diet limits highly saturated fats and trans fats, added sugars like sweetened beverages, but even things like added sugars in bread. Um, so high sodium or added salts, processed and red meats, alcohol and packaged or processed snacks are all strongly discouraged on this diet. So as we investigate some of these nutrients and components of the diet, keep an eye out on your fridge and see how you can envision some of these changes and how they can translate into your own kitchen. You know, I really like what you showed us. Can you just backtrack two slides? Um, right here, go, go, go. So you can see that just changing your diet will lower the incidence of coronary artery disease by 15%, stroke by 27%, because high blood pressure is very much causal in stroke. If you advance one more slide, um, 
is that we're trying to get more beans in the diet. They say they took they, they took half the proteins um, from from plants, half of it from you know lean chicken, lean beef, and some fish. So um, I'm trying to incorporate a lot more beans into to, to my uh, environment. And th this is actually just doing halfway. You can see that uh, I think the healthiest protein on the planet right now is, is, is from beans. It's best for the environment, it's best for your health, and it's best for the animals. Um, but you can see you go part way. And uh, so that, that, that's wonderful. Um, tell us more. Yep. So now we're going to dive into some of the macronutrients um, and how they sort of translate in this diet. So carbohydrates are an essential macronutrient and energy source. You probably already know this. On the DASH diet, 55% of total calories come from carbohydrates, which falls in between the recommended distribution range between 45 and 65% uh, for AMDRs or the dietary reference intakes. Um, the key is to focus on complex carbs that are higher in fiber and starch, and to especially avoid refined carbohydrates that lack dietary fiber and essential vitamins. Um, so that could be choosing whole grains over refined grains, which have not been stripped of the bran, bran and germ, like refined grains, and hence retain some of those essential micronutrients. And another op option is um, natural carbohydrate sources, and, such as fruits and starchy vegetables, and like Dr. Kearney said, beans, um, to name a few. Um, so complex carbs, which you can see from the molecular structure, we've added a bit of science here on the bottom here of a polysaccharide, uh, which not to get into too much de detail of, consists of long chains of these simple sugar units. Um, and compared to single carbs, uh, simple carbs, which are just singular units um, that are found in most processed foods, such as baked goods, like those muffins you can find in the grocery store, breakfast cereals. And, candies and sweets, and those are really devoid of any nutrients. Uh, and complex carbs can promote slower digestion due to their molecular structure, longer energy storage, and they also retain those vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants that are really beneficial. So here are some DASH friendly examples of incorporating carbohydrates. So dark green leaves and vegetables like broccoli, kale, spinach, uh, collards are a great source. Um, whole grains, as we discussed, are another example. Uh, in the clinic, we talk a lot about quinoa, uh, oats, millets, barley, rye, and those are a few that you can perhaps incorporate into breads, which we'll get into a little later, um, and substitute for rice. Uh, legumes and beans like kidney and black beans, um, chickpeas and lentils um, are another source of, um, and also like low glycemic, glycemic index fruits like apples, bananas, and oranges. So those could also be included into the diet. So ultimately, you should be avoiding refined carbs uh, that you might see peaking from your pantry, like white rice and bread, um, some sodas and breakfast cereals. So we're going to try to replace some of those. And we kind of talked a bit about whole grains. Um, on the next slide, we've kind of added a video that you can reference to learn more about whole grains, which are key to the, key, uh, the DASH diet. So you can check out this video on our channel. Um, and once again, if you've watched this video, you might be able to answer this question. Which type of fiber reduces absorption of cholesterol in the bloodstream? So check out that video as well. It's really helpful in learning about whole grains, why they're better than other um, whole grain bread specifically, why it's better than other types of breads. Um, and yeah, we strongly encourage you to check out that video. So go backtrack one slide again. Um, this, this is really a very neat bit video. I think many of us, including myself, are addicted to bread. Um, and bread for some people it could be a source of, of a very high, it's, it's, uh, bread traditionally has a lot of salt in it. Uh, bread traditionally, if you just use white bread, which is a four letter word in, in, in my way of thinking of it, is, is no good. And, uh, and, and learning really how to choose a better bread and we're actually uh, even talk about how do you make these breads later even better by replacing, you mentioned um, salt is, is contributes to high blood pressure, potassium, uh, does the exact opposite, and uh, so uh, and there's actually better ways of adding more potassium to, to food as well. So we'll learn more as time goes on. But uh, for all those bread lovers out there, take a look at this video. It's really well done. So moving on on the Dash diet, healthy fats in moderation can help prevent inflammation, provide essential fatty acids like omega three and six uh, for energy storage and cell function. Um, but what do these healthy fats look like? That can be really confusing for some people. Um, so unsaturated fats, another little science fit here, as you can see from their molecular structure in this diagram, contain a carbon to carbon double bond, uh, which you can see from that little kink over there. 
Um, so what you can see is those two carbons bonded uh, and two hydrogens are missing. And a simple way to describe this difference is how unsaturated fats, which we've listed here, monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats that have this carbon double bond. Um, um, so unsaturated fats like vegetable oils um, have kinks that prevent them from being tightly packed and thus they're liquid at room temperature. But saturated fats like margarine and butter are solid. So it's a structure that allows for healthy unsaturated fats to promote reduced atherosclerotic plaque formation uh, or atherogenesis with reduced total cholesterol, LDL, and triglycerides. So an overall improved lipid profile compared to saturated and trans fats. So some DASH-friendly examples include vegetable oils like olive oil and canola oil, um, obviously in moderation, avocados, nuts like almonds and walnuts, seeds such as sunflower, flax, chia seeds, hemp seeds, um, and then omega-3 rich fish um, like salmon, tuna, mackerel, sardines. Um, and ultimately what you wanna avoid here are trans or saturated and trans fats and hydrogenated fats or those that have been hydrogenated to extend their shelf uh, lifetime. So a lot of processed foods. So you wanna avoid those really fatty processed foods um, that have a lot of unnecessary fats added to them when you can simply um, replace those with some healthier unsaturated fats alternatives. It's kind of interesting if you just backtrack that one slide there, people say, what's better, margarine or butter? They're both terrible foods. So um, so none of them are good. Um, I like the concept of that, uh, you know, you, you have this extra virgin of olive oil and it has some, some properties that are, that are good for people. It actually lowers blood pressure. The problem is that uh, one tablespoon of uh, olive oil is 110 calories, 120 calories, um, and it's already processed. Uh, so to me, I'm trying to eat real food. I'm trying to avoid any processing whatsoever. So, uh, and I think you mentioned the two, some of the two better oils are extra virgin olive oil and, and canola oil. I, my argument is that um, I'm, I'm, instead of buying oil, I'm trying to go try the, 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 the olive. And, uh, and one of the things is that we grow soybeans at our farm. So I eat soybeans. I don't get soy oil or, or whatever. I don't process them. I just, I just, I just put them in a, a pot and boil them. And uh, there you go. So look at them, these foods here, just so eat, eat, eat a few. So, you know, have some flax and chia seeds and put into just sprinkle on your salad if you like to with it. And if you want to put it through a grinder so you, you can get the liberation of the actual foods instead of the oils. So, um, um, what wonderful, but good, these are great foods right now. And uh, so, this is, so this is this is mother's nature at its best. Mother nature knows the secret recipe. Uh, we as human beings mess up all the time. So eat the foods that mother nature gave to us. If you can't pronounce it, uh, you probably shouldn't eat it. Exactly. Um, yeah, funny enough that you mentioned soy. We kind of put that in our next one. I think you can see over here that there's some soybeans here. But um, a final macronutrient is protein. So on the DASH diet, it's encouraged to consume lean meats or meats that are re relatively low in fat content. So these include poultry, fish, and eggs. Um, but it's also, like Dr. Hurdy said, strongly encouraged that you eat plant-based. So getting all these macronutrients from plant-based sources, uh, so plant-based proteins, such as legumes, um, nu like nuts, seeds. Um, then we put soy products here. So you can either do like boiling soybeans or do tofu. Um, that's something I like to do. So that's where it's like boiled and crushed. Um, and then also whole grains, like we talked about before. And studies have shown that uh, plant-based soy can actually reduce um, systolic blood pressure by two uh, millimeters of mercury. So just, just goes to support that. You know, there's a lot of diverse, uh, a variety of different sources that you can add to the diet that can help to ultimately improve blood pressure and other parts of your cardiovascular health. And on the next slide, um, we added a study from China that analyzed the benefits of a diet, diet with a variety of sources of heart healthy proteins on blood pressure. So the study analyzed data from more than 12,000 participants who self-reported their three meals every day and participants were given a score based on the variety of protein sources in their diet. So as you can see from this graph, participants that consumed less than two protein sources or had a very low protein diversity were more likely to develop new onset hypertension. And in fact, 35% of the study participants after six years developed new onset hypertension. So we can also see here that those that had um, increased protein diversity or consumed four or more or six 
protein sources in their diet had a 66% lower risk of developing hypertension. So this, this di um, study supports existing data regarding protein diversity and the benefits of nutrient diversity in getting a wide variety of essential nutrients from different protein sources. Um, so legumes are rich in potassium, which as we discussed, can reduce tension in the arteries and fish contains omega-3 fatty acids um, that can improve lipid profiles, but also selenium that can reduce inflammation and oxidative stress. So there's a lot of benefit to getting a variety of different sources into your diet, not just for protein, but for all of these macronutrients. Um, and to sort of conclude on this part of our, our presentation, um, we hope that you weren't drinking a glass of wine while watching this video. And if, if, if you were, you're in for some bad news. Um, on the DASH diet, alcohol is not recommended at all. As you may already know, alcohol is linked to cardiovascular damage and disease with effects such as increased heart rate, blood pressure, weakened heart muscles, atrial fibrillation, incidents, heart attacks, and strokes. So the list goes on. Um, so you do not want to be drinking alcohol. And the current guidelines for alcohol consumption are between zero to two drinks per week, but there's a still a risk associated with this consumption. Um, so we won't go into this any further, but to learn more about alcohol consumption and its risk to cardiovascular health, check out this video uh, and see if you can answer this question. Does drinking four bottles of beer a week um, align with the DASH diet? or true or false. Um, but yeah, you'll be able to answer that question for sure when you finish watching that video. I think this is actually an eye-opening video. Um, I know when we were preparing the video, um, uh, Jody and Jenna, you, you actually had different recommendations for alcohol consumption. Uh, you, you went by the old recommendations of about uh, 14, 15 drinks for, for males and 10 drinks a week, uh, about 14 drinks a week, week for males and 10 drinks a week for females. That turns out um, uh, you're, you know, you, you'd be a heavy drinker uh, in, in this day and age. And, and unfortunately, um, we learn and we change. So we have, we have some choices in this. So, so uh, one of the things that's happened right now is cancer is on the rise right now. And uh, we made a big impact on cardiovascular health. Uh, heart disease is no longer the number one killer. It's the number two killer in North America. Around the world, it's still the number one killer. Um, but cancer has gone up. And... Um, Two, two important considerations that I think you think about is that uh, smoking, obviously, we know about smoking is a type one carcinogen and alcohol is a type one carcinogen. It's associated with at least six or seven cancers, including breast, uh, breast, uh, breast cancer and colon cancer and many others as well. Um, the other thing that's associated very much with cancer right now is that the more you weigh, the more cancer you have. Um, so uh, so take, take a peek at that and just sort of think about uh, what you want to do or, or, or what do you want to change? And it annoys me to look at that video, but reality and science is how I changed. And uh, I, I picked up a new drink called kombucha. Kombucha is fermented tea. Some people like fine wines uh, or fine beers or craft beers. I'm, I'm now learning. I thank you, my, my wife, for helping is that uh, she makes the most wonderful kombucha. Kombucha is fermented tea. She uses lots of ginger and lemon and um we're going to experiment now with green teas and other other ways as well. So come join us. We'll, we'll, we'll have a kombucha club one of these days. And uh, uh, but it's, it's a really nice video to look at. And uh, and we know that uh, having good friendly bacteria in your gut is a good thing. Um, thank you. Keep keep telling us more. Take a look at that video, everybody. It's one of those things that uh, it's really it's really impressive. Nice done. Nice job done, ladies, for that. That was wonderful. Yeah, for sure. So um, now we'll be segueing into kind of looking at, now that we know what the DASH diet is, how it actually affects our health. So we touched on this a little bit before, but we're going to start off kind of defining more clearly um, hypertension, blood pressure, things like that. So hypertension or abnormally high blood pressure is um, when your blood pressure is above 140 over 90 milligrams of mercury. And for reference, the normal blood pressure is considered to be 120 over 80. But obviously, having a bit lower than that would be ideal. And according to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, actually globally over 47% of adults have hypertension. So it is a very, very common condition. I'm sure a lot of you are experiencing it. And that's why it's so important to take control as early on as possible. So it's so, interesting, if you just backtrack one slide, you, 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 we start off saying a quarter of Canadian adults have hypertension. Here we say 50%. Um, 
But if you live long enough, 90% of Canadians will likely develop high blood pressure in their lifetime. Uh, so and when you have high blood pressure, it means you have diseased arteries. You don't, you, you don't get high blood pressure with normal vessels. Those arteries are, are diseased. And I'll remind everybody, an average 50-year-old, uh, 85% of, of a 50-year-old or a 60-year-old will already have atherosclerosis. And I, I feel great. Um, having high blood pressure, you feel great the day before your stroke or your heart attack. And um, uh, for the vast majority of people here, so uh, I can't feel my blood pressure, um, but I can, I'll, I'll know as hell, or I shouldn't use that word, but I'll know if I had a stroke or a heart attack or, or sudden deaths, Alzheimer's disease, cancer, et cetera. Um, so these are important numbers. And every day of my life, I hear people say, I, I, I can feel my blood pressure has been normal. And uh, is that I encourage everybody to get a good machine, use it, measure it a, a few times a week, and look at those videos, how to measure it properly. Uh, and then people measure their blood pressure and it's up one day and uh, the world hasn't collapsed. Um, blood pressure does fluctuate. It's normal for blood pressure to fluctuate. So please learn um, how to lower your blood pressure here with, uh, with good, healthy f food and also how to measure it properly. And, uh, and uh, thank you. And uh, I, I keep telling you, I, I know we, we talked about this before. In one of these webinars, I had a blood pressure 160 or 110. I was here with Simon. He got really nervous. Um, <laughs> I didn't. Um, because I had 24 ambulatory blood pressure monitor recently, and then I measured myself the blood pressure on the weekend where I was much more relaxed, and that blood pressure turned out to be around 120 uh, over 85 or so. Uh, so, you know, it's, it, it's uh, and, and so you, you need to know multiple numbers, not the blood pressure. You should never measure the blood pressure in front of me because it will be, it will be higher. Um, and I, I always find it's kind of a joke sometimes, like you go to the dentist and measure your blood pressure. I'm not sure if it's before or after the bill, um, but, um, you know, blood pressure is designed to react predominantly in a relaxed environment. And these are ways you can actually prevent damage of vessels. Thank you. Keep, 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 keep telling us more. Yeah, for sure. So that's why it's really important um, to measure regularly, like Dr. Kuhn, you mentioned. And if your blood pressure measurement is very often like higher than 120 over 80, but still lower than 140 over 90, that should be like a good indicator for you to talk to your doctor and have like a discussion, a discussion about potential hypertension. And great that you mentioned that because now we're gonna tell you how to use a blood pressure machine properly. So um, we'll tell you how to use it and also how to read it. For those of you who have a blood pressure machine, it's also very good to just invest in one so that you can measure it regularly at home. So for using the blood pressure machine, you should position your arm with your palm facing up, just like the picture. And then you should place the cuff with the two pointing down around your arm um, kind of right above your elbow and position it so that the tube is in the middle and then tighten the cuff until there's room for about two fingers to fit in. And that's when you can start the machine. So after the machine does your blood pressure um, reading, this is how you're gonna read it. So a typical blood pressure machine has three numbers. The first one um, is gonna be the heart rate or pulse. And this is the number of heartbeats that your heart is producing per minute also known as the resting heart rate, and that will be shown here. Um, and heartbeat can depend on a lot of things like age, lifestyle, also just like circumstance, whether you're nervous or not, or have been exercising, but it should usually be between like 60 to 100 beats per minute. And the other two values are called systolic blood pressure on the top, diastolic blood pressure on the bottom. So systolic blood pressure occurs when your heart is contracting and diastolic is when your heart is relaxing. So these are the three numbers that you should be paying attention to. That's kind of interesting. So both machines, you know, the, the, the systolic, which we talked about, the diastolic, and then the, the heartbeat. Don't forget the heartbeat. I, I think of um, normal heartbeat somewhere between 60 to 70 to 80 beats per minute. Uh, if it goes much above uh, 80 beats per minute, um, then you uh, need to think about why. Um, and if you have congestive heart failure in a weak heartbeat, a weak heart uh, muscle, we aim for a heartbeat of around 60 beats per minute. So it's, it's an important number. If you're a well-trained athlete, you can have a resting heartbeat around 40 to 50 beats per minute as well. So lots of circumstances. And uh, and uh, important thing is don't panic. Just write it down, multiple numbers, and uh, and we'll, we'll work on that together. Thank you. But don't forget the heartbeat. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And um, if hypertension goes untreated, as we talked about before, it can lead to a lot of complications like stroke or heart failure, coronary artery disease, and also renal disease. So 
Because of this, it's really important to take your blood pressure regularly. And since we know now how much it can fluctuate, um, you should take it morning and night to make um, to get as many measurements as possible. And so now we'll be taking a look at how the DASH diet helps adjust your dietary intake and also how it's been proven to lower blood pressure in people with hypertension. So there was a clinical trial conducted that was similar to the DASH trial that Angela was talking about earlier. And um, in this trial, they provided DASH diets for stage one hypertensive participants over an 11 week period. And basically there were two different adjusted, diet, adjusted diets that were made available. The first one being a fruits and vegetables diet. And then the second one was the DASH combination diet where it had fruits and vegetables, but also low fat dairy products and um, a reduction in total and, unsat um, total and saturated fat. So um, the results of the study showed that people who were randomized to the DASH combination diet experienced a 5.5 milligrams of mercury reduction in systolic blood pressure. And then their diastolic blood pressure was reduced by three as well. Um, in contrast, the fruits and vegetables diet that produced um, a 2.8 decrease in systolic blood pressure and then 1.1 decrease in diastolic. So the outcome of it was that both of these adjusted diets did help reduce blood pressure for, the, um, for those stage one hypertensive patients. But the DASH combination diet, which had less dairy and also fat, was proven to be the most effective of them all. Now this is important. If you if you just backtrack again, these were people not with severe high blood pressure but mild hypertension. Mm -hmm. um, and what we do know is that for every ten millimeters reduction in systolic blood pressure, you lower your risk of having a heart attack by about twenty percent, um, congestive heart failure, stroke uh, by about thirty to forty percent. Um, so that, that's pretty huge. So a great impact. So. Um, uh, you know, is that uh, be attentive to that. Um, on average, each medication will give you about five to 10 millimeters of uh, lowering of blood pressure. Uh, lifestyle gives you usually about half that amount. Um, and so you can combine all these factors. And uh, so to me, that most people who have significant high blood pressure will recom combine two to maybe four drugs to control their blood pressure. So one drug is not often enough uh, to lower blood pressure, but if you are in good lifestyle changes, you use less medications and, and potentially um, uh, maybe not any medications, but uh, as time goes on, I think most people with high blood pressure will require medications um, and good lifestyle changes. And you have some choices here. So you choose to drink, choose to be overweight, choose to not exercise, choose to be anxious, stressed, poor sleep, um, uh, and, and have more, you know, 70% of your calories are, are from processed food. I think we're in trouble. Um, and what I want people to think about is picture yourselves 20 years in the future uh, and you're in a nursing home because uh, you had a stroke, you can't walk. Uh, for us guys, we can't uh, urinate properly. Um, and how do you want to spend the last number of years of your life? Because the last few years of life are often spent suffering. Um, and uh, right now is that uh, I'm doing whatever I can for my health and for your health. So I can delay those days. Um, and I hope you do the same thing too as well for your health. And uh, I thank uh, the team for really working hard at this. So uh, uh, every, every millimeter of blood pressure you can lower is a good thing. Thanks, show us more. Yeah, anyway, for sure. One thing I get when I come up to is people, can my blood pressure be too low? Um, we're designed to have a blood pressure around 90 uh, over 70. We can function extremely well. If you, I, I'm envious of people who have a naturally low blood pressure let's say 90 over 70, um, is that uh, if you if you start off with blood pressure 150 over 110, you're down, down to 90 over 70. Uh, and maybe that you've damaged your heart so badly that you can't generate a blood pressure. That's not a good thing. Uh, so having a low blood pressure spontaneously is not, is, is a wonderful gift. And uh, um, so don't, don't get it, don't, don't get worried if your blood pressure is low. Um, we can decide what to do. But there's some people will get, you know, low blood pressure and dizzy and pass out, but that's pretty well um, the, the exception rather than the rule. So have a low blood pressure is a great thing. Keep telling us more. Mm -hmm, for sure. Yeah, this is quite an impressive reduction given that it's like natural methods and only over an 11 week period. So yeah, moving on, we'll tell you even more um, benefits of the DASH diet. So other than those like kind of 
blood pressure reductions that the DASH diet brings, it can also provide um, further cardioprotective benefits by lowering LDL, which is commonly known as the bad cholesterol. So high blood pressure and also high LDL in the blood, as we know, are major risk factors for heart disease and stroke, and LDL makes up most of your body's cholesterol. So having too much of it can cause kind of an accumulation, um, and it can become sort of deposited on the walls of your blood vessels. And this plaque is what can contribute to, contribute to those heart diseases and complications down the road. So there was a systematic review conducted that supports the DASH diet in um, causing reductions of LDL and with blood pressure. So we know there's a lot of you with diabetes as well, which means that the DASH diet can also help for that condition and also general risks of heart disease. So a lot of prospective cohort um, studies in this systematic review revealed that um, administering the DASH diet, it had a lot of cardioprotective benefits. So it reduced LDL levels in patients by 0.2 millimoles, HbA1c levels by 0.53%, um, cardiovascular disease incidence by 20%, stroke incidence by 19%, and also diabetes incidence by 18%. So these are all very, very um, notable numbers and very impressive reductions. And since also a systematic review is the best compilation of available evidence, this all um, just really goes to show that the DASH diet, it really helps like a fast array of heart-related conditions. Okay, so another question that a lot of you may be having is, whether the DASH is the best option available for weight loss. So in that systematic review that we just looked at, uh, they also found that the DASH diet helped reduce body weight and adiposity by, um, by 1.42 kilograms. So basically uh, the DASH has been proven to be fairly sustainable, but in this section, we're also gonna explore how perhaps one of its downsides is that the rate of weight loss that comes with it can be a bit slow. So in terms of diets for weight loss, there are so many different options, and we're just going to do a quick comparison of the keto diet, which is where you avoid eating carbs and obtain most of your calories from protein and fat versus the DASH diet. So the main focus of the DASH diet, this is something that you should note, is not actually weight loss, but more so to promote like healthy eating habits, but you will be eating a lot less processed foods. So um, in the end, with both types of diets, you will get weight loss. However, you will probably experience greater weight loss um, during the first weeks of the keto diet, followed by a slower or steadier loss after a few weeks, as shown in this graph on the left. But in the DASH diet, you might get um, steadier weight loss, but also slower throughout the weeks. So the reason for this is because in a ketogenic diet, you're going to be using more calories to burn um, or to change fat and protein into energy than carbs. Whereas in the DASH diet, you can still eat carbs, but you will just be focusing on healthier options like grains or whole grains actually. So overall the DASH diet may be a more suitable and sustainable way to lose steady weight for a lot of people because you get to um, have less restrictions on what you eat, but you still are sticking to foods that are healthier. The other thing to realize is on the keto diet, you actually lose a lot more uh, water early on. So you're not actually losing um, um, uh, fat yeah. mass. Mm -hmm. So, um, so you, you, you may not be doing quite as well as you want. I can actually be down 10 pounds in one day if I really exercise vigorously. Uh, that's not, uh, that's not, that not, not fat loss, that's uh, water loss. And uh, so and, and a keto diet, diet makes you actually uh, lose more, more, more fluids initially. You have to wash out the ketones in your urine. And, um, and uh, so I'm not saying you can't try a keto diet. I would, I would try a healthy keto diet. I would try, you can try dash diet. And, you know, is that, um, uh, we'll come back a little bit later. What is the best diet for weight loss in, 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 a, in a little while? Keep telling us more. Yeah, thanks for sure. The distinction between like water weight and um, actually losing fat is something that you should keep in mind. And one of the things that, that before uh, I forget about this is that uh, Ozempic has become very popular for, for weight loss and it's a wonderful drug for the right person. But if you're not careful, you can actually lose muscle mass as well as fat loss too with, uh, with uh, Ozempic. So if you're any diet as well, you need to exercise and need to add some resistant exercise and 
proper and adequate protein too as well. So uh, these are important and most of us are not protein deficient, uh, we're exercise deficient. Uh, I know I've been guilty about uh, not enough resistance training and I've actually started a program and I realized how weak my upper body is, but I'm gonna get there. I'm gonna, uh, I, I don't care about looking good. I, I care more about my insides being good and healthy. So uh, keep, keep, keep telling us more. Yes, okay, for sure. Exercise is very important. Um, and another diet that we want to talk about or type is um, the intermittent diets, also known as intermittent fasting. And this is where you limit the hours of the day in which you are um, you allow yourself to eat. And these are also quite effective for losing weight. So according to Harvard Health, they found that the best window for intermittent fasting would be earlier in the day for around seven to eight hours. So that might be look like from between like 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. or even 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. However, doing this intermittent fasting diet would also require um, that you ensure not to overeat after this window is over. So you should really make sure not to overeat um, to get the optimal effect in weight loss that you want. So you're eating between 7 a.m. and 3 p.m. or between 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. Is that what is that the, uh, that, that the suggestion here? Uh, you're fasting between 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, or 10 a.m. Fasting. To 3 so there's different, yeah. there's different regiments that people talk about. Um, um, my biggest downfall is nighttime eating, so I haven't conquered that, but I'll keep working on that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sounds good. And around this time, we'll kind of do another segment of this pop quiz. So to learn more about intermittent fasting and also its benefits and how to do it, you can check out this video, video from the cooking club called Intermittent Fasting. And that will also allow you to answer this pop quiz on what are some things that you actually can consume during that fasting window of intermittent fasting. Okay, so we're gonna speed run through some of the benefits and disadvantages of, of the DASH diet. So we know that's an ex pretty accessible, it's a pretty flexible and fairly affordable plan. We've already seen some benefits to blood pressure and lipid profile, but how does this actually work? Um, so one benefit of the DASH diet is that it's rich in dietary components known as antioxidant properties. So th these are things like phytochemicals and polyphenols that are found in a lot of uh, nutrient dense uh, foods like um, dark greens and leaves and berries um, that are included in the DASH diet. So oxidative stress uh, occurs when there is an imbalance between reactive oxygen species and our endogenous or, or the antioxidant capacity of our cells. So uh, reactive oxygen species are these free radicals or unstable molecules um, that contain oxygen. And due to this instability, they can easily react with other molecules in the cell. So an excess of these molecules can cause damage to our DNA, RNA, and proteins uh, that are essential to cell function. Um, and unhealthy carbohydrates and fats can promote this oxidative stress. So the DASH diet actually raises our antioxidant capacity, which can ultimately lower blood pressure and reduce oxidative stress. Um, and oxidative stress, if not like, um, if not, um, if not taking antioxidants or having keeping that balance, um, it can promote atherosclerosis, increase blood pressure, cardiac dysfunction, and ultimately can cause heart failure. Um, but antioxidants can help this. And we know this, um, if you can see this diagram over here, um, they help uh, prevent the formation of these free radicals by neutralizing them or donating an electron, which makes them more stable. And this can help reduce uh, LDL oxidation and reduce plaque progression and potential rupture. So um, like I said, many of the foods in the DASH diet contain these antioxidant properties. It's a great source of antioxidants. One study found that DASH adherence can help um, in controlling some of these biomarkers for oxidative stress. So reducing MDA levels and in in increasing um, glutathione levels, um, which can provide some antioxidant defense. So this sort of, um, the way that um, antioxidants involved in the DASH diet can sort of balance these parameters of oxidative stress as shown in this study, um, can provi pro 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 provide a significant uh, basis for reduction of oxidative stress um, with the DASH diet. So that's just one benefit, antioxidant properties. Um, another is nitric oxide bioavailability. So foods consumed on the DASH diet are often high in nitrates, uh, including beetroots and leafy greens, such as kale and spinach. So dietary nitrate, um, the remaining of which is not excreted by the body, uh, can be converted into nitrate by oral bacteria and then in the stomach reduced to nit nitric oxide. 
So the nitric oxide, any remaining nitrite is reabsorbed by a vascular flow, continues in circulation, where the remaining nitrite can be reduced into nitric oxide. So the dash site offers a potential increase in nitric oxide in the bloodstream. Um, ins insufficient nitric oxide in our blood vessel walls or low bioavailability of it is what causes uh, endothelial dysfunction, which is an indicator of early cardiovascular disease. Um, and nitric oxide in our vessels promotes vasodilation, meaning that it causes the arteries to widen or dilate or relax, which you can see in this diagram, which overall improves our uh, blood flow to the heart and reduces stress on the heart and ultimately blood pressure. Um, so the DASH diet has been shown to increase bioavailability of nitric oxide. Um, we found a study that actually showed that 500 milliliters of intake of beetroot juice, which contains about 1,437 milligrams of a nitrate dose, uh, reduced systolic blood pressure by 10 after two and a half hours and reduced diastolic blood pressure by about eight after three hours. And that affects sustained for 24 hours. So blood pressure reduction is it's correlated with a peak in plasma nitrate. However, this research has been countered by other studies that found no significant effects with dietary nitrates on blood pressure. However, these positive results do tell us that there could be significant, there could be effects um, of formulating diets that are healthy and incorporate some of these um, dietary nitrates. With the DASH diet, things like beetroots are rich in folate or vitamin B9, which controls damage to blood vessels. It's rich in potassium, fiber, and some other uh, essential nutrients that align with the DASH diet. Um, I personally use them sometimes in salads because they have a naturally sweet taste. So, or you can make a soup with them. So there are still some benefits um, regardless. Now, it's kind of interesting is that um... You mentioned antioxidants. Why don't I just take some bunch of vitamins or just take, I can, I can give nitroglycerin, which is full of nitrates. So, so one of the things that was tested uh, is that uh, vitamins is that uh, they, they don't, they don't work. Um, so right now, just so a number to remember is $50 billion is spent annually in the United States a year on supplements. Um, the greatest people who benefit is the people selling the supplements. Um, and they really, they, every time we test a supplement, they, we went through beta carotene, which increases the risk of, of lung cancer, vitamin C, vitamin E, uh, uh, homocysteine lowering uh, with folic acid and other cocktails, including B12. It didn't pan out to reduction of cardiovascular disease. If you go to the next slide, we even actually tried using nitro, nitroglycerin nitrates in people coming with a heart attack because of this vasodilatation property. The trials were negative. Uh, they, didn't, they, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't prevent you from dying or having a heart attack. So I, I think what you, what you mentioned is that Mother Nature knows the secret recipe, the secret sauce. Um, and it's, you know, what is that cocktail? When we try to tease out the, what we think are the most powerful ingredients, we don't get it right. Um, so that's why I'm getting away from, from processed food. I'm trying to get all my nutrients as much as I possibly can from real whole food. And, uh, and uh, maybe in, you know, in the future, we'll have a better understanding of this. But right now, um, these trials have been really very, very disappointing um, uh, when it comes to supplements. Uh, it was becoming very important. You just mentioned, look at that. You mentioned over a period of just a few weeks, you can actually lower blood pressure. And lowering blood pressure probably means there's also healing of the vessels as well. Uh, so very important information. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, you know, an apple a day keeps a doctor away. That's probably really true. Tell us more. Yep. So another benefit here is reduced arterial stiffening. So arterial stiffening refers to loss of elasticity in the walls of the arteries over time. Um, and this is related to another number of factors, such as endothelial dysfunction, calcification, uh, reactive oxygen species, induced inflammation, we discussed these earlier, but also high sodium diets can increase oxidative stress and hence impair endothelial function and increase vascular stiffness. So these are all predictors of cardiovascular disease. Um, and reduction of dietary salts is a key element of the DASH sodium diet. So that's a separate one we'll discuss later. Um, and hence, it, the diet offers an approach to improving vascular health and blood pressure through that low sodium diet. So here's a study that, um, that um, found uh, 13 patients with treated hypertension and compensated heart failure and pr with, a, with preserved ejection fraction um, that consumed the DASH sodium reduction diet for 21 days. And they saw these significant decreases in systolic blood pressure, uh, diastolic blood pressure, but also um, in their uh, femoral uh, pulse wave velocity, 
uh, which is a measure of arterial stiffness. So not only did they see these decreases in blood pressure, but they also saw this decrease in this metric for um, arterial stiffness through this dietary sodium reduction. Um, so a higher pulse wave velocity is seen in higher sodium diets, and it can not only indicate arterial stiffness, but predict cardiovascular events and potentially fatal ones. So this study just shows how the DASH diet can supplement um, uh, already because these patients did have treated hypertension, how it can supplement drug therapy in an existing treatment. And the last benefit that we have here is that the DASH diet has also been linked to an increase in atriuretic action, um, which refers to excretion of sodium in the urine. So studies have shown that the DASH diet can promote loss of sodium in urine. Um, as we can see through this study, which recruited about 375 adults with mildly elevated blood pressure and no medications, and they consumed the DASH diet for about three 30-day periods. What we can see in this graph is that the blood pressure and salt excretion were plotted for each patient, um, and there's a steeper slope with no shift in the curve for the DASH diet that indicates enhanced salt excretion on the diet. So these findings further support how the DASH diet can help to lower blood pressure uh, through this diuretic action. And then quickly some disadvantages. Um, with many diets, it's always sustainability compliance. The DASH diet requires cutting out all those processed and all those ultra processed foods that are high in sodium and sugar. I don't know about you, but those are pretty common in some of the diet, some of my meals. Um, so it can be challenging to maintain a diet long term. Um, a 2013 review of DASH interventions found that the DASH scores reduce after controlled interventions. So a lot of what we've talked about are these um, settings that were more research studies where patients or subjects were provided um, food uh, in, in real life settings where they only had some dietary advice, they found that these uh, levels of adherence decreased. Um, only 21% of participants in another study achieved DASH targets after three months of dietary counseling. Um, and then from 2007 to 2012, the average US DASH adherence score was about 2.6 out of nine. So studies have shown that it can be difficult to um, adhere to, and that's valid because it does require cutting out a lot of foods that perhaps we're used to consuming on a daily basis. But as we've seen throughout this presentation, the risk factors heavily outweigh any issues with compliance. Um, and it's why we strongly encourage all of you who might be struggling with cutting out some unhealthy foods to take a look at these studies and see that the data is out there. The data supports that diet can help to improve your cardiac profile. Um, some other disadvantages are that it follows servings. This can be difficult for some individuals to create personal menus and meal planning uh, without some specific guidance or support. It also might have some deficits with recommended foods lists. Um, as you can see, when we listed some of the macronutrients, there's a bit of overlap there. Uh, for a lot of people, this might not be very comprehensive. It might lack some clarity. Example, avocados could be categorized as a fruit or a fat. So we don't really know where they fit in as a serving. Um, so there also could be limits for those with lactose intolerance or food allergies. Um, and it can be hard to limit convenience foods, but the advantages significantly outweigh those disadvantages. Uh, and that's what we wanted to kind of just mention here that like with any diet, there can be some disadvantages, but there's a significant amount of benefits to this diet that we hope you consider taking into consideration. Yeah, so now we'll just segue into a discussion sort of about red meats, sugar, salts, and vitamins. So one common thing that um, a lot of you have probably heard is that red meats are bad. So this is true because there's a very high saturated fat content in red meats. And saturated fat, what it does is that it increases the levels of that harmful LDL in your blood. So red meats are also high in a compound called carnitine, and this is something that causes atherosclerosis, which is the hardening or clogging of your arteries. And once in your body, carnitine converts to a heart damaging compound called trimethylamine and oxide or TMAO, and that is via bacteria in your gut or intestine. And this um, TMAO really can lead to a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. Also. Um, Sorry. Some studies have shown that uh, red or processed meat can also increase your risk of developing type 2 diabetes. So in, one, in some studies, they found that consuming 3.5 ounces of red meat daily led to a 19% increase in the risk of diabetes, which is quite a huge um, risk increase. And overall, all of this points to the 
conclusion that you should cut out your red meats whenever possible. And we'll also just um, touch a little bit on unhealthy sugars and how to keep them out of sight because you know, a lot of people, um, including myself, have a sweet tooth. So if you've been having difficulties with limiting your sugars, implementing the DASH diet can really help with this because it consists of restricting your sweets and added sugars intake. So for the DASH, it, it consists of maintaining sugar intake down to less than five servings or tablespoons per week, whereas the average American adult, teenager, or child in comparison consumes about 5.7 tablespoons of added sugar daily. So this is really crazy because it means that the average American has more sugar daily than of that which is recommended um, in an entire week for the DASH diet. And also for reference um, of a serving of sugar, one serving is about equivalent to one tablespoon of sugar, jelly, or jam half a cup of sorbet or one cup of lemonade. And here are some tips and tricks to um, keep those unwanted sugars out of sight. So um, instead of adding sugars, you wanna stick to naturally sweet products like fruits and also try using things like syrups, honey or molasses rather than table sugars. Um, white or brown sugars. And if you don't really have these ingredients readily available, you can try using half the amount of sugar that you would usually use in your recipes as well. And on a similar note, we're going to be talking about um, potassium and sodium. We already talked about this a bit before. Sorry, just, you know, so one of the things, no that, what, I, what I'm thinking is that uh, I don't have the orange juice anymore, you know, um, you know, is that uh, I have the orange and, uh, you know, and uh, what I'm doing is I'm cutting up the grapefruit. I'm trying to eat the, 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 the actual food itself. Um, doesn't mean you can't treat yourself. Um, and, uh, you know, if you want to put a little bit of honey or syrup, but just, you know, they're, they're not health foods, but, um, but you know, we, we, have to, we have to enjoy life too as well. So just try to look at how to, uh, you know, I think if sugar is a derivative of cocaine, stimulates dopamine, gives you a quick high, and then, uh, um, and then you come crashing down afterwards, I guess, and uh, it just you start to crave it more. So I think, at least for me, I think sugar is an addiction. Um, personally, is that um, 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 I'm afraid of cocaine because I'm addicted to sugar. So I just figure if cocaine, it will be that much stronger, and uh, I, I, I might get myself into trouble. So, so to me, um, um, I'm just trying to eat the fruits and vegetables as much as I can. But like yourself, I have a sweet tooth, and um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I, I struggle with that. I don't have all the solutions, but uh, I realize that, that that's important. And maybe thinking food as an addiction or sugar as addiction is not a bad way of looking at that. So thank you so much for sharing that. So no more juice for anybody. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah, even if you do use substitutes, remember always use in moderation. Um, so for uh, the sodium versus potassium, which we were discussing earlier, um, having too much sodium can contribute to risk of hypertension and disturb fluid balances, but potassium on the other hand can decrease your blood pressure, also provide cardioprotective benefits. And it's also really one of the most important minerals in our body to regulate fluid balances and also to maintain sort of healthy muscle contractions and um, nerve signals. So the DASH diet has lower um, sodium in it than the typical American diet once again. So a normal diet can have up to 3,400 milligrams of sodium a day, whereas the DASH diet limits it to 2,300 milligrams a day. Um, and then the lower version of the lower sodium version of the DASH diet limits it to even um, 1,500 milligrams a day, which is significantly lower than the average. And actually multiple trials were conducted in China that investigated the health impact of sodium chloride, which is your usual table salt versus a potassium enriched salt substitute. Um, so in addition to a control group that had regular salt, there was an experimental group which received the potassium enriched salt and that had 25% potassium chloride and then 75% sodium chloride. So those groups were followed up for around five years and then after that, it was found that the salt substitute group, they experienced 14% less stroke, 13% lower risk of cardiovascular events, and 12% less risk of death, death than the group that had only sodium chloride. So basically, this um, really showed the benefits of lowering sodium intake and kind of substituting that sodium in with potassium. So um, if available, potassium chloride can really be used as a great salt substitute when you're cooking or baking, and especially for those of you who know you need to watch your sodium levels.
And here's just a picture of it. You can find it on Amazon, but you will have to add it in yourself to whatever you cook. This is actually huge. Um, this is actually, again, we, we, we spent a lot of time telling us that potassium is good. And when you replace potassium from, replace it with from salt, this is actually a 25% replacement and just the added food to that. That's a huge reduction of stroke, cardiovascular disease and total mortality. So to me, this is very, very important. So uh, what I'm trying to do is, I, and you actually showed us how to get potassium from from green leafy vegetables and other other foods as well. So I'm, I'm really, really thinking about um, not the potassium chloride. And certainly you can do that because we, we don't have, a, we have a salt shaker, but I don't know where it is. Um, <laughs> is that only 25% of salt comes from a shaker. Most of it comes from the food that you have. And my number one source of, of salt is, uh, is, is bread. Um, and uh, so, um, um, and yes, those, 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 those salty snacks and things of that nature and other places as well, that processed stuff is that it's very rich with salt because, you know, the combination of salt and sweetness makes us want to eat more. Um, so how do, we, how, do, how do we deal with that in some way? So, uh, but this is actually a huge landmark trial. There's two trials from China that clearly show that uh, replacing uh, potassium with salt uh, makes a huge difference in stroke and cardiovascular health and mortality. Thank you. Yeah, great. And now touching finally very quickly on that DASH sodium trial that Angela was talking about. Um, in this trial, it was very similar in structure to the original DASH trial. There were three levels of sodium intake available, which were lowered equal to or higher than the typical American sodium consumption. And then there were two dietary patterns. Um, and this was all done again on adults who had stage one hypertension, so not too severe. And the dietary patterns available were the typical American diet versus the DASH diet. So um, the results of this were that they found um, pairing the lower sodium intake with the DASH diet really lowered blood pressure to an extent that um, was not yet demonstrated for any other non-pharmacologic treatment. So that would be like anything that's not a blood pressure lowering medication. So. This really goes to show again that the DASH trial is a very, very good natural way to kind of control your health and also consuming as little sodium as possible is best. So now we just want to talk a little bit about uh, sort of goals or what you should be looking for when you consume micronutrients. So for the DASH diet, they recommend a daily intake of around 4,700 milligrams of potassium, 12, 1,250 milligrams of calcium, and 500 milligrams of magnesium. And especially for sodium, you should really keep in mind to have no more than 2,300 milligrams a day and also um, around like 1,500 or less a day for those with high blood pressure or other risk factors as well. So these are, this is just a list that you can feel free to like screenshot um, of foods uh, with high potassium, calcium, and magnesium respectively. And as you can see, a lot of foods that are rich in potassium. Um, all of these foods are very natural, but we'll look at potassium in more detail right now. Um, potassium, uh, in this table here, you can just see some potassium rich foods as well as their proportions and how much potassium content each of those contains. Um, and you can see that beans, almonds, and raisins have high potassium content in comparison to everything else as well and potatoes. So those are some things that you might want to look for in your fridge and keep in mind when you cook in order to fulfill your daily potassium intake. So it's very interesting. People say, I'll have a banana. Look at banana is about just under 500 milligrams of uh, potassium. Um, look at baked beans. A baked potato has twice as much potassium uh, if you have it with the skin compared to banana. Um, and so, uh, so, so look at the look at these foods. Now, one of the one of the foods that you guys taught me about is quinoa. Uh, and one thing we can look at look at the, the label on this quinoa here. So again, a, a quarter cup is uh, 170 calories. Uh, has five grams of fiber, six grams of protein. But one of the things I'm concentrating is sodium, four milligrams. Uh, mm -hmm. Potassium, 198 milligrams. And one of the things on a food label is that you should look at the milligrams of sodium and milligrams of potassium. And you want the food to have more potassium than sodium in it. So uh, for instance, many foods will be, I don't know, like a thousand milligrams of sodium and 300 milligrams of potassium. Uh, you, want the, you want to get the reverse. So 
if a food has more sodium than potassium, maybe it's a food you shouldn't choose. Um, um, so I, I think that's really important. So, uh, so one of these new foods to me is, uh, is, is quinoa. And, um, and, you know, a baked potato um, is, is a wonderful food. Um, is that, uh, you know, we can, do, and, uh, and, 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 and it's just not bananas. And just backtrack one slide again too as well, because I, I always find this is very important is to look at this. Some of the things we need to think about is, you know, calcium in the diet. Um, and many of us, osteoporosis and, and, and calcium, and many of us will consume dairy, low-fat dairy products, and that's what the DASH does recommend it. But there is a concern right now that uh, dairy products may be associated with certain cancers, including breast cancer and prostate cancer. And, and, and there's a debate about that. It's not a done deal in my mind. Um, and uh, so I think is that we need to look at that. So what I try to do right now is that I'm eating a lot less dairy and a lot more um, uh, a lot more things like oat milk, soya milk, uh, almond milk, and things of that nature. And I make sure it actually has it has uh, calcium in it. Uh, some, most of them have it, some don't. And shake the container because you don't want the calcium to be on the line or you want the calcium to get into you, into you and things of that nature as well. So take take time to explore these foods. Uh, and, uh, you know, is that, uh, I, you know, one of the, one of the foods I, I have to get into my diet is bok choy right now is that uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful food. I don't know how to use it yet. Uh, and I'm going to. So, um, I, I, and, and one of the things I, for instance, is that uh, uh, spinach, um, well, it's a healthy food. The, the calcium content is hard to absorb because it has some compounds that prevent absorption of that, where kale doesn't have that, you see. So, uh, um, so I'm learning a lot more of these things. Look at these things, these foods here. So make your diet more rich in these foods and the real foods. Um, really important. So uh, I, I think it's time to pause and look at how your diet can change. And uh, I go periods of time where um, I'm eating a lot of dates. I'm afraid of raisins because there's a lot of sugar in the raisins to me, where dates seems to be my, uh, is more nature's candy, so to speak to me. And uh, so look at that effect. So if you're going to have chia seeds or you're going to have um, uh, flax seeds, you should probably grind them up so you make sure you, you, you get the, um, the, the absorption that you want because you don't want just to go pass through your system. Um, but thank you for sharing. And soy is one of these wonderful uh, new foods. And for women going through the menopause, a half a cup of soy a day will help decrease menopausal complaints because it has a soy-like, estrogen-like compound that is not harmful to you, um, that actually decreases the amount of flushing. And also uh, beans make you feel full and eat less. So uh, tell us more. Yeah, for sure. You should try to incorporate more of these foods in your fridge. And lastly, we kind of talked about this earlier, but we just want to touch on um, kind of that ongoing debate between synthetic versus natural nutrients and whether they kind of reap the same benefits. So um, I'm sure that a lot of you take synthetic nutrients, including multivitamins, and synthetic nutrients are vitamins that have been produced artificially in an industrial process, um, whereas the natural source nutrients are obtained from food sources that we get in our diets. So it's really important to note that a lot of aspects of these um, synthetic nutrient absorption in our body are flanked by a lot of uncertainties. So that means some synthetic nutrients may be absorbed well, whereas some are not. And this is because when we get our nutrients from real food, we're actually consuming um, along with it a wide range of like vitamins, minerals, and enzymes at the same time. So that allows for like optimal absorption and use in our bodies. But for the synthetic nutrients that are isolated and also consumed separately, it's likely that they're not processed or used in the same way within us. And um, therefore the bottom line is that it's better to get our vitamins and nutrients from the actual natural products themselves because they have a greater protective potential against a lot of diseases. And the DASH diet does exactly that because it promotes kind of a lot of fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. And that's why we're pushing for it even more. To backtrack one thing, I'm going to say much stronger. Vitamins are a waste of money. Um, uh, where uh, real food is, uh, is is really good for you. Um, it doesn't mean that in certain cases here, if you're if you're vegan, you need to get B12 supplement. Um, you need to get the proper vitamin D. But you know, we go on haywire, and 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 we're trying to replace. Um, you know, vitamins for proper eating. It's like saying this is that, uh, you know, you're, you're, you can't get somebody else to exercise for you and you cannot replace mother nature with supplements at this stage. Uh, we don't know the secret recipe and when we test it well, we failed miserably hundreds of times. Um, 
And so, um, and I'm enjoying uh, real food uh, more and more. And uh, am I perfect? Absolutely not. Uh, am I getting better? Hopefully I am. And so you, you, so, so, so you can do as well. And thank you for everybody for short sharing those, those, those thoughts. Tell us more. Yeah, I will also just really quickly add that a study found um, naturally sourced vitamin E, like from fruits, were absorbed two times more efficiently in our bodies than the supplements. So yeah, make sure you're getting them naturally. We mentioned vitamin E. So vitamin E, pe people who take vitamin E have half the chance of having a heart attack or stroke compared to people who don't take vitamin E. People who are randomized in quality trials show no benefit whatsoever. The reason that, that people who take vitamins by and large are, have other health behaviors. It's not the vitamins, it's the other health behaviors that you're doing. So if you're taking mm -hmm. vitamin E, chances are, and other supplements, your chances are you're eating better uh, and, you're doing, and, you're, and you're doing more exercise and keeping your weight down. Um, uh, yeah, keep telling us more. So we're reaching the end of our presentation. It's got a little long, but we actually have a video about this, um, about calories and energy intake. Um, so on the next slide, we actually have um, just some of the DASH recommended servings. So we know the DASH diet is based on servings. Um, so this is a sample for a 2000 calorie a day DASH diet. You can take a look, um, six to eight servings of grains, four to five servings of fruits, four to five ser servings of veggies, two to three servings of low fat dairy, uh, less than six one ounce servings of lean meat, uh, two to three servings of fats and oils, um, four to five servings per week of nuts, seeds, and legumes, and then less than five servings a week of sweets or added sugars. So these are the guidelines that the DASH diet follows based on servings. And we've added what some of these servings look like underneath each of them. Um, so you can take a look at this and see how you can perhaps add this to your diet or follow this. Um, as We just wanna mention though, that the, the sweet and the added sugars are per week. Um, the others and the, the nuts, seeds, and legumes are also per week, but the grains, fruits, veggies, low fat dairy, lean meat, and fats and oils are per day. Uh, and that is for a 2000 calorie a day DASH diet. So on the next slide, um, we've added um, how to calculate your estimated energy requirement. So this depends on a number of factors, including um, your age, your sex, your weight, height, and level of physical activity. Um, so we've added how to calculate it here, um, but we will add it in the description box a link to how you can calculate this without having to do the math. Um, but this is something fun that you can do to see how many calories based on your individual profile you're supposed to be consuming in a day. And then you can formulate your servings uh, based on that. So on the next page, uh, we did put um, some of the acceptable macronutrient distribution ranges. I think we talked about this for carbohydrates earlier. Um, so these are the distribution ranges for carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Um, so you can see how the DASH diet fits into these. Um, and if you're up for the challenge and want to calculate some of these um, ranges for yourself, um, the next slide shows a very, uh, in our opinion, a pretty cool video um, where you can learn how to calculate some of these values and check out how to learn more about the DRIs and nutrition labels, which are an essential aspect of any diet and, and maintaining any diet. You need to make sure you're able to read those nutrition labels um, and make sure that, like Dr. Kearney said, finding things that are lower in sodium, higher in potassium. So being able to read them is, is important and knowing how much you're supposed to uh, intake a day is also important. So Go back to that 2000 calorie DASH diet for a sec here. Um, so kind of interesting if you uh, just go back one more again, if you look over here, so what, what I'm trying to do is that I'm probably high on, on the grains and, um, and uh, but I, I've actually decided for the fats and oils is, is not to add fats and oils. So uh, I use balsamic vinegar for my salads, for instance. Um, and also what I'm thinking uh, uh, for me is that, uh, you know, you learn how to cook without oil. Um, Oil is a processed food. If you do like oil, you know, make it very small amounts, extra virgin olive oil, which is hard to get if you like. You, you can use canola if you like cooking and things of that nature as well. But I think we're better off actually eating our foods and uh, trying to avoid these sorts of things. And so, so instead of, you know, like uh, um, having oil, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put a little, little bit of slice, a little bit of avocado into my salad or something. Um, and uh, so, and one of the things to actually bring out, um, 
iron absorption right now is adding vitamin C. So uh, having things like orange, man mango, uh, red, red pepper to that food and things that need having some lemon juice on there all actually helps uh, help the absorption of the foods. And I think you put it really nicely when you're saying is that it's the ensemble that's important. And um, I think that's important. So um, uh, I, I think this is a wonderful uh, approach right now. Um, and, and you have to pick and choose the things that you want to do. Um, uh, but this is something that's really, really important. Most of us don't eat as much as we do. Most of us have half the fruits and vegetables that we should. Um, and I'm trying harder. And, uh, you know, you can get frozen ones or the the winter time, um, I, I always buy with the apples on sale th that week, and uh, this week, you know, grapefruits on sale, so I got that one, and um, and uh, and I, I think there's some wonderful choices to be made, and uh, thank you for sharing us. Tell us more. Yeah, so we're almost done. Um, on the next slide. Junie, you might detail a day of Dash. Dr. Kearney, you've touched on a few of these things that we included in our day of Dash. We adjusted it for a little bit more of a less caloric intake. Um, Junie, I don't know if you wanna go through the day, but. Yeah, for sure. Um, for interest of time, we won't go through everything extensively, but here we've kind of planned out a day following a Dash diet. So for breakfast, you might have avocado and egg toast, and then you might have a snack with like Greek yogurt and fruits, followed by lunch, Mediterranean mixed salad, another snack of just fruits. And then for dinner, sort of like a grilled salmon and vegetables dinner. And on the bottom row, we've kind of laid out all the ingredients and also um, how much of each ingredient you need with the serving. So this should be helpful if you are kind of looking for a place to start, um, get started on for the DASH diet, you might want to follow this. And we've kind of adjusted it to have more of like a vegetable intake, less of like a fat and oils intake. So yeah, it's like an even healthier version of the DASH. And you remember, if you just Google DASH, you go to the NIH, they have recipes and a whole program for you to follow. Um, I wish I was part of that initial D DASH cohort where they actually gave me the food and didn't have to cook it. but. Uh, um, but, uh, and, and, and so, uh, so someone brought two cookies into the office yesterday, guess who ate them. So uh, bring, bring the Dash diet into the office <laughs> instead. Thanks for sharing that. Tell us more. Yeah. So this is a, a little shout out to the clinic, um, making your own bread. Yes, we have made our own bread and we are trying our trials for making bread that does fit in with the Dash diet. So these are some of the things that we added into our um, clinic bread. Um, so we added some whole wheat flour, we added some sunflower seeds, flax seeds, steel cut oats, chia seeds, pumpkin seeds to add a little bit of taste. I know we said no oil, but we did add a bit of olive oil in there. Um, and we also added some minimal salt. We know that salt does need to be added to activate yeast. We are investigating the potassium salt substitute. So we'll get back to you on that. But um, these are just some ways that if you do have a bread machine at home, just throw in all the ingredients. Um, that's what we did. We, Dr. Kern, you gave us some chia seeds and some oats and we just dumped them in there and it turned out to be a pretty good loaf. So um, yeah, and Dr. Kern, how did it taste? It, it, it didn't make it out of my car. Um, so I ate it all <laughs> the way home to the hockey game that night. Uh, so it was, uh, I, don't, I don't, it gave me an extra little boost of energy and, uh, but it was wonderful. Homemade bread through a bread machine, wonderful. Um, but uh, yeah. Yeah, keep trying new things. It was wonderful. I hope we could, we're gonna make it. We're gonna try again. And we're thinking about you know having our our cooking club back at the clinic again. We're, we're thinking maybe Fridays um, afternoons, evenings. We might try some other days as well. Um, we used to have it on Sundays, but uh, the turnout wasn't that great. So if people want to cook with us, uh, send us some some information, and we'll we'll get you involved. We'll have to figure out the best time for everybody, either cooking online or in clinic or some hybrid of both, because it's so much fun. Yeah, and keep tuned because we'll be trying to release the video for making this whole wheat bread soon. Okay, and also to find some more information about healthy eating and also recipes that align with our DASH diet, which you've been talking about, check out um, our book, 30 Days to a Healthier You, which you can get from our clinic. I have mine right here, so it's a really <laughs> <laughs> And we're just really gonna go over some food guidelines. These are really quick. Um, the DASH diet does align with the Canada's food guide. 
It, we've talked a lot about half a plate of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, lean meats for proteins and plant-based proteins. The difference between them is that the, CIA, um, the Canadian Food Guide doesn't use servings. It, it follows this plate format. The DASH does use specific servings, but diets aren't one size fits all. Um, it's all about incorporating what works best for you. So the DASH diet can align and is very similar to the Canada, uh, to Canada's food, food Guide. Yep, and lastly, um... Brazil actually is very interesting because it's um, really known for its food-based dietary guidelines, but it doesn't actually have a food guide like Canada or America. Um, but despite this, the Brazilian population really has like a healthy eating style and a lot of their food comes from like environmentally sustainable systems. And these are the 10 steps that Brazil proposed um, to their general population for a healthy diet. So you can read through these, um, but some things that we want to point out are that Unlike the food guidelines here, their national guidelines are a lot less um, sort of punitive. So they don't dwell on things like nutrients or calories or weight loss. And instead they just kind of focus on um, encouraging uh, or discouraging processed foods, oils, fats, salt, and sugars, and really encouraging kind of home cooked meals. And another interesting point to note is that Brazil really stresses the importance of eating in company of others. And it's like a huge part of their social culture. And this is pretty good because um, when we're eating alone, we kind of tend to feel like there's nobody around us to keep our proportions in check. But when you're eating around people, you might sort of like engage in conversation, also sort of keep an eye out on how um, you portray yourself while eating and taking all of these factors into account, um, it often makes it easier to maintain sort of like reasonable proportions. So yeah, keeping these Brazil, um, Brazilian tips in mind can hopefully allow you to sort of realize how to limit your consumption of processed foods and also track towards healthier eating habits. And when you do see this YouTube video, um, go a little up further on our YouTube channel, you'll see a little search bar um, and you can search for any videos on our channel. If you're interested in learning about the cooking club and all their videos, that we have, um, search up cooking club, triglycerides, type in triglycerides, and you'll see an array of videos. Here, I think we put cooking club triglycerides. You can see how many videos came up and you might find these videos pretty helpful. So um, yeah, just feel free to navigate and use the search bar on our YouTube page to find some other relevant and applicable um, YouTube videos that might help you in your healthcare journey. So uh, actually there's a couple of videos, if you just backtrack there, so, um... Lowering cholesterol with diet. That's a video that's just done. It's about an hour and a half, just over that. That's really a very helpful video. Um, those individuals that have high triglycerides on the top there is that reducing triglycerides. So um, one of the things is that sugar qu quickly goes to, uh, to, to triglycerides. So for things like alcohol, most white foods, white sugar, white flour, white bread, are all important. Getting your weight down, uh, exercising. These are really really key issues. If, you, if you're saying it, I can't afford to eat, go we have cooking on the budget. Um, so, uh, and the cooking club has so many good vi videos from, from, from bean cooking to Mediterranean diets to uh, uh, intermittent fasting and uh, now the, the DASH diet. So please explore and try these different things. Go ahead, tell us more. So we've added this here. Um, this is a repository to find uh, a dietitian repository to find some dietitians in Canada. We've added the link here. We'll add it in the description box as well. Um, but if you just put in some information, you can find um, some nearby dietitians. Um, one of the things we mentioned was that a difficulty in compliance and sustainability is lacking guidance and not knowing where to start. Um, so if you need some more assisted guidance, and if that comes from a dietitian, um, here are some resources to help you find a dietitian that can help provide a more personalized uh, nutrition plan for you. Um, and we've listed some in Hamilton. Um, but obviously for those of you who don't live in Hamilton, there are resources like the slide before that can help you find someone near you. And finally, we've just added a healthy eating assessment. So if you've watched all of this and you're thinking about what you ate for lunch and what you ate for breakfast, and you're like, I'm not eating healthy, let's put it into a score and assess where you need to improve on. Um, here's a healthy eating assessment from the government of Northwest Territories. Um, and this assesses just overall eating habits, um, what types of foods you're eating. You don't wanna be in that red spot. So we hope that tomorrow, if you take this test, after watching this video, you'll be in the green part. Um, and keep up 
good work in maintaining your health and maintaining healthy food choices. Um, we hope this video can help you in that journey um, and help you gain good scores in assessing your own health. Um, and yeah, I think that's all that we have. Um, if you have any questions, email us at this email address, uh, drkernu232 at gmail.com. And we sincerely thank you for watching this video and hope you learned a little bit more about, if not managing hypertension, just some healthy, um, healthy steps you can take to improving your health and staying healthy. <laughs> that was just wonderful. So, um, you know, diet lifestyle changes complements medications. And, uh, and uh, sometimes I see people are just polarized. I just want to um, go into lifestyle changes. If you have significant severe hypertension, you cannot manage it well and be safe with, with just lifestyle changes. On the other hand, you can actually reduce the pill burden. If you have mild hypertension, you can prevent it from getting worse and actually putting yourself back on the clock here. You put a simple thing like a tomato um, um, is that, uh, you know, for instance, if you eat a raw potato, you get more of the water soluble vitamins, including, uh, you know, vitamin C. If you cook the, uh, the, uh, the tomato, you get more leukopion, which is an anti-cancer property to it. So there's so much to learn about all this thing right now. And, uh, you know, is that, uh, so spend the time Look, learn, and participate, and enjoy cooking and, and eating. Uh, um, I want to thank the team. That was just wonderful, fantastic. I know it's a little bit long, but uh, these are important concepts. Daniel, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm going to echo the, the sentiment that I think the, the team has put on a, a wonderful presentation here. Uh, I think my biggest takeaway was learning, I think, how important potassium is um, in our diet, and especially, like, you know, if we go back to that, I know it's a little bit far back, just going back to the slide with all the different, you know, foods and all the different potassium intake or different, um, you know, amounts of potassium in each one of them. And I'm sure many of our viewers, including myself, actually, um, like you mentioned, Dr. Kearney, were under the assumption that, you know, bananas are like one of the best things for potassium. But really, there's a lot of options here um, to pick from in terms of getting your daily potassium. I think this is something I'm going to share with my family because my dad's always been big on eating bananas because he's he's uh, he's very good at you know tracking his micronutrients and making sure he's getting enough potassium and I think he's been relying a lot on bananas but he does like there's a lot more options as you can see here and like bananas aren't the best they're good but you know like you said baked potatoes or you know uh, raisins are are fantastic options as well so. Uh, I think my biggest takeaway is just learning about the importance of potassium really in our diet, as well as all the different options um, that, you know, I wasn't aware of beforehand. Danger, but raisins are rich in sugar too, as well as have to be careful. Look, look at spinach. Look, look, look at that. And so, so to me is that uh, having more beans, there's so many different ways of approaching this right now. And uh, yeah, wonderful. Um, I want to just thank the entire team and you got me excited about cooking, eating and how to be better and how to be healthier. And uh, thank you. And uh, I hope we spend more time cooking together, going shopping together um, and uh, wish everybody a good night and uh, more potassium, more fruits and vegetables. Um, and, and one thing you mentioned, a 2000 calorie diet, if you're trying to, if you're over the age of 60 years of age and you're a sedentary lifestyle, you're basic metabolic rate is about 1200 calories a day. Uh, so you need 1200 calories just to survive. Um, if you wanna lose weight, you have to take off 500 calories a day to lose a pound a week. Um, and I don't know of anybody who can be under a thousand calories on a long-term basis. And so to me, you know, exercise and uh, getting your metabolic rate up there um, is so important too as well. So this is just one great pillar of health. and. Uh, there's so many things you have to think about. So uh, thank you all, everybody, and good night and uh, happy eating.